Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Today's show is brought to you by OnPay, the new standard in payroll. You can pay employees and contractors in minutes, automate your payroll taxes and filings, as well as provide health benefits and HR in all 50 states. For more information, visit buildingthefutureshow.com slash onpay. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Yarun Korthout. He's the co-founder and CEO at Salesflare. Yarun, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. How are you? I'm, I'm very well. Yourself? I'm doing fine. That's good. So I'm, I'm excited to have you on the show today. I think what you guys are doing at Salesflare is actually really interesting and cool. But maybe before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Yeah. Um, I grew up most, most of my youth was um, in uh, the Dutch speaking part of Belgium in Flanders. Okay, Although I was born in uh, in the U.S., I was born in New York State. Okay. Uh, a, a bit upstate from New York in a place called Yorktown Heights, uh, Westchester County. Um, gotcha. And then um, we moved back to Belgium because my parents are, are Belgian, Dutch speaking. Uh, but then at some point, my dad had to jo- like uh, move jobs again. And uh, we lived in the French speaking part of Belgium where uh, they dropped me in kindergarten and I... Uh, I just had to learn French like that. Um, <laughs> but then we went back to uh, the Dutch speaking part of Belgium. And uh, that's where I stayed most of the time. So that's uh, close to Antwerp uh, for people who know the city. Got you. So you went to university, well, a bunch of places. Do you want to walk us through um, your education and, and what did you take and why? Yeah. Um, I went to university in, in uh, Leuven, which is close to Brussels. Okay. Um, it's basically a 15 minute drive from Brussels, um, a, a smaller town uh, next to it. Uh, it's one of the historical um, university cities in Europe. And I studied engineering there, uh, first electrotechnical engineering with some business management, and then I did biomedical engineering in my, in my master's. Um, I combined this with going to the uh, Politecnico in Milano, in, in Milan, in Italy. Okay. Um, that was a, it's a, a sort of an exchange program that we can do here in Europe, which is called Erasmus. So you, you go for half a year or a year somewhere else. And then after all that, I, um, I studied business school as well. This I did as well in, in Leuven uh, at uh, uh, a business school called Flerik, which is the the, the top is a school here in the Benelux, so Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg. Very cool. So what got you passionate about kind of engineering and, and biomedical technologies? Yeah, uh, engineering, actually, I, I always knew I was going to become an engineer. Uh, I was sort of raised like that. Um, my dad uh, always uh, has led research organizations. He's, a, he's an engineer, quite hardcore. Um, uh, actually the, the job he has now is more like, um, uh, more like a sales position, uh, than anything else, but before he was always, uh, in, in research. Um, and he raises in such, such a way, me, my brother, and uh, tried on my sister too, you could say, uh, <laughs> to get us into the engineering thing. Um, my brother almost studied the exact thing that I studied, um, my sister ended up becoming a doctor, so he sort of uh, he sort of uh, missed it there. Um, <laughs> but uh, none of us now uh, have an engineering job. Um, my uh, my brother is uh, almost a partner at AT Carney, which is a, a competitor of McKinsey. Right. Um, yeah, my sister is is becoming a pediatrician, and I have a, a software company. Uh, so funny. none of us is doing engineering work. Why, why did we study biomedical engineering? Um, 
well for me it was just the the possibility of making a, a an impact um I, I i i i could choose from electrotechnical engineering between things like energy and microcircuits and telecom um but the medical thing just felt like i could i could do much more with my studies plus i could also have all these interesting uh, medical courses next to the usual engineering stuff, which was really appealing to me as well. Very cool. So walk us through your career up until co-founding Salesflare, and then let's dive into that. Yeah. So, so right after business school, um, I decided I was going to sort of build experience to start my own company because I knew for a long time already, since I was 15, 16, that I wanted to do my own uh, stuff. At that point, I was I was building websites for people and I thought I'm gonna have a website agency at some point. Um, in business school, we had all this kind of um, uh, orientation exercise and I always landed on uh, having my own company. Now, the thing was, I, I figured I need to get some experience somewhere before I do that. Uh, so I'm gonna work in some bigger companies first. Okay. That at least was the idea and sort of very uh, promoted as well. Um, so I chose a position in, in marketing in a pharma company. I was a biomedical engineer after also doing stuff in the medical uh, sphere. Uh, and I figured that a marketing position as a, as, a, as a sort of, I was a very junior product manager, uh, that was going to be the right place to get some experience on how it is to put a product in the market. As, at least that's what I thought, because uh, what I discovered then is that uh, in that role, I, I really didn't have a lot of freedom uh, to put a product in the market. It was mostly about uh, building brochures and uh, then um, teaching the sales team how to use them. <laughs> so I got very disappointed with that uh, very quickly. And I started looking um, for companies to start I stumbled upon the idea of doing a web agency again, but then this time for pharma companies, because I figured they had no idea what they were doing. Um, none of the people in, um, in, 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 in marketing and pharma um, knew anything about digital websites because they're basically almost all uh, former salespeople, not very tech savvy. Right. Um, so I, I thought there is something there. And then I, then I had dinner with a guy uh, that I knew that I knew was doing something in that sphere. So I wanted to get this idea and he ended up hiring me. Um, it was sort of what he was doing. He, he had the consultancy helping pharma companies um, to digitalize, to adapt to the new world where it's not just about sending salespeople to doctors anymore and then getting prescriptions. Now, uh, sale, uh, like doctors can read stuff online, patients are online, communication happens through all kinds of channels. Uh, so we were helping pharma companies do that. One of the things there was building websites. Uh, and in my initial times there, that was very much what we were doing. Uh, but over the four or five years that I was there, um, we evolved that into doing really full consultancy uh, projects. Uh, everything involved from marketing, market research to, to measurement. Um, and we would, we would actually replace sales forces uh, with huge multi-channel campaigns, um, which were much cheaper and actually even in some cases more effective than sending salespeople to doctors. Um, and that's where I got experience with um, how marketing and sales works and CRMs and all that. Um, I had to use Salesforce in that job. And that's, it's, it's from my frustrations with Salesforce, partly that, uh, that actually Salesforce started. Interesting. So how, how did you take that frustration into actually deciding to build your own CRM? Yeah, uh, actually, yeah. It, it took a while. Um, let's say first my frustrations when I was working in that consultancy were, were just frustrations. Um, like, like people told me like, this is Salesforce, it's gonna help you organize your sales. And I took that seriously because I, I believe those people. Um, I then figured pretty quickly that it didn't really help. It was very 
complicated for what I was, it was trying to achieve. And it didn't really help me um, like organize myself. It was really great for us as a company. Like we would have an overview of all the deals and the companies we were working for. Um, and then on, on the top level, we could say like, okay, this is gonna be our revenue and stuff. Uh, but it didn't really help me or my colleagues as salespeople to um, get our jobs done. We would organize ourselves somewhere else, which I always found fascinating that we had Salesforce in which you could put tasks and activities and all this kind of stuff, but nobody was using it. So, and, and then we, at, at sales meetings, we would always get into these weird issues where uh, one person was talking to a customer and then the other person is like, but I'm talking to that customer there. And then, you know, we would get into this complex situations or fights about who was going to get the, the commission on something. Uh, just because Salesforce was not um, complete at all. Uh, and then our CEO would say, uh, what's, what's not in Salesforce does not exist. Um, and then that, that would be it. And we, 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 we started getting some rules like about how many calls we had to uh, place and log in Salesforce, things like that. And then people would place that exact amount of calls in the CRM, but it really didn't help much. But I, I didn't do anything with that insight for a few years, uh, which, which, which was your question, like when, when did I then um, do something with that and, and how did that happen? Yeah. Um, at that point, I was working with my current co-founder in another software company. Okay. Uh, we were doing some, something in business intelligence. Um, and we went to a big conference. It was an IBM conference in Vegas um, because we were selling software that was compatible with uh, IBM software. And we had a lot of good leads to follow up after that conference. And I knew Salesforce was going to help with that, uh, help us with organizing that. Uh, we had a good look around. Uh, we tried different systems. We sort of tried to build something uh, by ourselves uh, with Google Sheets and all. But wh whatever we tried, whether it was some CRM and many of them looked way better than Salesforce uh, and were much more specialized uh, towards organizing sales, it always still failed like whatever we did. And it didn't fail like, like you could say on the software's end, it was us um we we didn't manage to fill these systems out the way they expected us to fill them out and if we didn't fill them out like that like like almost like like perfect data input robots um then also we didn't get the value out of the system and it was sort of become useless interesting and that's when we figured actually that many of the things or almost everything that we were filling out was stuff that we did in other systems and more and more of these systems had become digital uh like we were emailing uh, which is which is obviously digital and then uh, now then in in one tab basically and then in another tab we would say okay we email that guy you know we would go back and do something else and then go back in the crm and then log that um we the same with phone calls the same with meetings uh, in your calendar um stuff like email tracking everything was super disconnected and we always ended up inputting it manually into the CRM and we figured if it's all already somewhere why don't we build a system some kind of software that pulls it all together and organizes it for us so we can better follow up our leads we don't we know everything um, in one place we don't miss any the people we don't disappoint anyone we actually make more revenue um all we need to do is just basically pull that information together offer it and make sure that with 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 as as little click to, clicks as possible uh we can organize what's already there uh that's when we started building salesforce we initially didn't see it as a crm um, we actually figured like lots of companies have an issue with Salesforce. Why don't we build like there's so like support systems? Why don't we build a sales system that integrates with a CRM uh, for bigger companies? We tried to sell that for a while, but um, uh, people were used to doing sales in the CRM and they didn't get why they would need a, another system. Uh, 
So that didn't really work out. But then at some point we, we saw that what we built, uh, which was a very practical system um, to organize your sales, easy to use and all that, that was a way better match for small companies. And we had some, some other startups in, in our, our startup incubator around and saying like, hey, I could use this. This looks awesome. And that's why we, we switched and we said, this is actually going to be a CRM, but it's going to be a CRM for SMBs uh, rather than a, a, a specialized sales system for enterprises. Interesting. So how did you guys fund the initial versions of Salesflare? Did you guys just self-fund? Did you raise a little bit of money? Walk us through that. Oh, uh, a bit of money everywhere. <laughs> uh, we started off with some money from an accelerator. Then we added from, from another accelerator. Then we got some subsidies. Then we got some bank loans. And then at some point, revenue started coming in. Uh, we got some more subsidies, some more bank loans. You know, like always, always uh, different places get money so that uh, we could bridge gaps here and there and, and make sure that it all... Uh, kept growing until, until revenue uh, so, sort of started uh, catching up. Sure. So you guys have been or around for quite a few years now. How has the product evolved over, over that time and, and changed? And how have you kind of managed the, your internal roadmap um, against customer feature requests? And how do you decide what makes it into uh, the actual product? Yeah, it actually, Salesforce started off in very initial uh, stages. It was purely available in your mailbox. So okay. you would open up Gmail or Outlook and Salesforce was on the side. So you open it up an email and then on the right, Salesforce would say, okay, this is this customer, this and that. Uh, it would track your emails and all that. Uh, at some point, people started saying, like, I, I, I really love this, but other CRMs also have this full screen kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and now we, we figured, like, oh, yeah, that's true. Maybe, maybe we should also uh, build an interface that uh, really uses the full screen if you, if you want to just work from the CRM, not from your mailbox. Um, so we built that. And then from there... It's lots of, yeah, lots of important changes on all kinds of levels that we added. Uh, it's, it's, it's really largely uh, built um, based on customer feedback. So in customer conversations, when people ask us to build a specific feature, we will always uh, go deeper and try to understand why they want something. Uh, and we really dig towards like, what is the, the core problem that we're solving here? What is it that they're suggesting? Uh, but record that, but don't make it like, okay, we're gonna build this feature. More right. of like, okay, what, what are the, the, the issues that people have? And, and we, we probably sort of have a solution in mind. Group those. Um, we then uh, see based on the amount of requests, which ones come up often, but then we actually prioritize uh, based on the, the impact we think these features will have on our customers. Um, and that's on different levels. It's also on the levels of like, how is this going to impact uh, how many people sign up for our software? How many of those turn into paid users? How many of those uh, stay longer? You know, these kind of things. And then we also align it with our, uh, with our vision. Uh, our vision of, of making something easy to use that is more and more automated and that makes that in the future. Um, it's, it's a system that just works by itself and salespeople just have to take conversations. Um, does this work towards this vision or, or not? Um, and then that, that all sort of rolls into one formula, um, which informs us about what the most important features are, but then we still uh, sort of use our, um, our intuition as well, uh, because formulas are all nice and stuff, uh, but it's just an indication that score. Uh, we see like, okay, what, what are we going to make? Uh, also versus uh, the amount of effort we think it, it'll take. And when we then make things, um, 
we have kept track of everyone that ever asked for these things. So uh, when it goes live, we can actually go back to these people. We say, hey, you asked for this. We uh, built it and we asked for feedback. And then that feedback again goes back in our process, uh, but not really as a feature. Uh, it goes back as, as uh, we call it uh, internally, it's, it's UX, label UX, but it's like improvements. Right. Um, and that gets into another flow where we uh, do a lot of small improvements all the time uh, to make sure the, the, the software gets better, uh, gets more understandable and, and features are more, more and more complete. Interesting. So walk us through, I, I get it's hard to give kind of like a product tour virtual, like without visuals, but walk us through some of the features that make you guys different and automated compared to other tools in the marketplace. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's mainly first about how everything flows. Uh, okay. So if you, if you do a feature by feature comparison, um, some others out there, you'll think like, oh, this does the same thing. But then if you actually start using it, you'll see that uh, Salesforce is built um, with automated data inputs as the norm. It's like the standard and manual data inputs is there because then you can also adapt stuff and now and then you will add something, but we try to avoid that. Uh, so the, the system is built in such a way that it's really easy to create stuff without doing a lot of data input. Um, then on a feature level, um, some of the cool things we've, uh, we have in the software is um, like uh, email workflows. You can automate um, sequences of emails or flows because it's not just linear sequences. It can also be conditional. Um, so you can, for instance, email uh, people until they reply um, from your mailbox. It's personalized emails that send as if you've sent them yourself. Almost technically, there's no difference. Um, and you can automate that even based on your data in Salesforce. So you can say if, um, if a customer hits a certain stage in the pipeline and you haven't heard them for a certain amount of days, then start emailing this sequence. Um, that's uh, something that we offer that uh, most other companies don't. Um, we have all the functionality on the mobile phone, which you'll find nowhere else. Um, every other uh, mobile app of a CRM system is, is a, a more limited version. It doesn't have all the functionality. Um, because we started initially from the mailbox where we also offer all functionality. Right. Um, we've just kept doing this. And uh, Salesforce is available with full functionality on every device. Uh, how many of your users then would you say are using uh, mobile compared to say like desktop on a daily basis? Is it like 50%? Is it more than that? Is it higher than that? Do you know roughly? I, uh, I, I don't track really by device, no. I wouldn't be able to say. I know a lot of our customers uh, pick it up on the go. Obviously now it's a bit less. Sure. Um, but uh, what, is, what is really important in our usage um, is, the, is the email sidebar, the thing we started with. Right. Uh, we see a, a ton of usage there. It's basically always there. You're emailing on the right. You have a company, you, you quickly create it. You add some uh, contacts. You can add a note, create an opportunity, all these kind of things just next to your emails. Um, a lot of our uh, successful users are, are using that extensively. Okay, very cool. So walk us through uh, pricing and, and how, how does that work? Yeah, uh, our pricing is, um, is for, for almost all the features. It's uh, at, at 30 a month per user per month on the annual plan and 35 on the monthly plan. Um, last week we launched uh, an extra plan uh, which is which is more aimed at at larger companies or companies that want to go slightly further in their automation. Uh, that's at uh, at forty nine and fifty five. Uh, it includes uh, things like the 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 email sequences of with with multiple emails after each other. If you just one email, then it's on the uh, on the other plan. 
uh, and user permissions, which a lot of larger companies are asking for, and soon also uh, the ability to build custom dashboards based on your data, um, including all your custom fields and all. Very cool. So you've been doing this for, for quite a long time. What advice would you give to people that are just starting out or, or uh, thinking about doing their own startup? People that are just starting out, um, have, they, have they started working on their company already or, or are they just still looking for an idea? Uh, I, I guess both, I, I think is probably both. a good, good idea to cover. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, no, it, it, because um, advice and the role of you as the entrepreneur uh, shifts over time. So that's why I was asking. I would say around that stage, uh, your most important job is to validate um, whether there's going to be enough people um, that want to pay you for the, the solution that you have to the problem they have. Um, and that's, that's all you need to care about. Um, I, I would say initially to, to, to validate that, do some customer interviews. It's really, really interesting. Um, if you want to have some frameworks on how to do that, I can recommend uh, the job to read some books on jobs to be done. Um, it's it's really interesting way of thinking about okay what is it that um, the, the sort of progress that my solution brings what does it solve um, how does it change people's lives um, especially there's this um, four forces kind of thing uh, by I forgot the name of the consultancy uh, but it's related to jobs to be done and it um, it also details questions you can ask to understand um, the decision people are making when it comes to switching solutions. Uh, but apart from that, you need to explore basically what are the problems these people have and what are the solutions they have currently, what's wrong with these solutions, what's good about these solutions, what would they like to have extra um, what value uh, do the current solutions bring? What value would they like? You know, explore that whole space so you understand uh, where you fit in. Um, and then from there, always at the end of each interview, um, ask for a few other people that you could talk to, which will expand your network uh, very quickly. And then as soon as you have something to offer them, show it back to them, say, what do you think about this? Uh, I mean, uh, would you pay for this? Or even better, <laughs> try to get them to pay for it. Uh, so, so start switching towards sales. But in the beginning, try to not sell. Try to um, uh, listen uh, and, and soak up as much as information as possible. Then start switching more to validating uh, your solution. And then uh, try to take it up a notch uh, and try to validate the fact that people are going to pay for it by trying to sell it. And that's, that's all you need to do in the initial stages. Um, in the meantime, I would say, uh, make sure you have some, uh, some income. Maybe if you have a good job, uh, try to go part-time or something, because this stage is going to take way longer uh, than you expect. Anything when you're building a company always takes longer than you expect, and it always takes more money than you expect. So make sure you're not uh, digging a hole in the ground or whatever. Uh, make sure that uh, you can you can do it somehow, and and get out alive. Uh, and if if you can't validate the, the the solution to the problem that you have, then uh, that you can move move on to something else. No, I, I think that's that's actually really good advice. The the other thing that I think that you brought up there that so many people are, are kind of told, especially kind of in in the States heavily is like, you need to kind of be all in and you need to like quit your job and just go for it. But yeah. that's not always possible for certain people, right? And there's been a lot of successful companies built part-time or in the evenings while working a full-time job or a part-time job or, 
or freelancing. And like, I think it's never really talked about that much. It's almost like frowned upon, but not a lot of people either can or want to quit that security until they've built their business up enough where it's making them money and it's validated, right? Because to your point, you could spend six months, maybe even a couple years chasing idea that is not going to make you money, right? And the sooner yeah, yeah. you can figure that out, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, it, 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 the, the problem is there that it's not all black and white. So that, part of the problem is people um, people don't make the jump. People uh, so so some people say the 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 job of of anyone who starts a startup is to make it not a startup anymore as soon as possible to uh, to make sure it it really turns into a business and. Um, there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there that I, I was one myself for quite a while. Um, you, you want to start something, but you just keep procrastinating and never take steps. And that's definitely bad. So partly people are pushing for like, okay, just like go for it, like spend time on it uh, and all that. Uh, but there is a delicate balance with um that sort of uh, thinking, like go for it, and um, and 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 the other one, which is taking unnecessary risks. So there is a timing for this, and I would say in the beginning, uh, maybe try doing it next to your job. After a while, you 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 want to spend more time on it. Go part time, or so try to see with your boss whether that's possible. In many cases, it will be. Um, and then, and then when you when you sort of know that people can pay you for it, and you see that the revenue is going to come, that's when you can take the step. That's when you can go really all in. Uh, and you definitely shouldn't shouldn't drag that out either. But um, jumping in too early is 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 going to hurt you more than uh, than waiting a bit. No, I think that's really good advice. You touched on something there that I want to dive a little bit deeper in. You said that you were procrastinating and putting off actually starting your companies. How did you get over that hurdle of actually deciding to go for it one day? Yeah, uh, it was uh, actually the Founder Institute that helped me. Okay. Um, one day I read about the Founder Institute that was a sort of accelerator in which uh, if you graduated, then you would have a company. Um, and I said, oh, that's great. I mean, it will get me it, it will get me somewhere. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen, but when I graduate from this thing, I'm going to have a company. <laughs> so I, I just applied. Uh, I got in and I went through the program and, and graduated with a company. That company was, was basically dumb. Um, <laughs> I didn't have a business model. I didn't validate that. I just, I just assumed I had one. I, I had something in mind, but I didn't really... Uh, figure it out properly so it, it failed um, but it, it got me started and it's from there I, I rolled from the one thing into the other it's also when you're doing stuff and when you're in movement that other stuff happens uh, as long as you don't do anything it's it's very hard to to get in movement yeah that's actually really interesting yeah you almost just need to get started and it doesn't really matter if your first few ideas kind of fail, it's because almost like those failures help you validate a real idea that can make you money, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, uh, Salesflare started from another software company and that was because I was actually, I met my co-founder in the Founder Institute. So if I've never have gone in the Founder Institute, he was, he was doing some other company. At some point he calls me, he says, I'm going to Vegas. I need a sales guy. I said, "Oh, I can join. I mean, I like going to Vegas. That's good." <laughs> and then, uh, and we went there. We did, we were quite successful. Then we had all these leads. We had needed a solution, and you know, and you start looking for a solution. And then Salesforce started. It just the one thing after the other just triggers uh, triggers each other. And at some point, uh, you're on something that works, and and then that yeah, and 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 doing that from from standstill is very very hard. Like just coming up with something and then um, and then trying to make that work from there you know, is much harder. Yeah, agreed. And I also think too, what's hard about that is 
you can generate a ton of ideas that you think are potentially something, but what you don't realize with that is like, if there's no market or there's no validation, or you haven't seen a hole in the market because you've been out there doing stuff, mm -hmm. like it's really, really hard to hit one like that, right? It's not, it's, I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's, it's a lot easier to be kind of just in there doing stuff and trying to figure it out than like yeah. sitting at a whiteboard, just brainstorming all day long. Yeah, 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 true, true. Interesting. So we're kind of coming to the end of the show, but how about we close with mentioning where people can get more information about Salesflare and any other things you want to mention or, or links? Yeah, if, if you want to find out more about Salesflare, it's easy. You just go to salesflare.com. Uh, and Flare is with F-L-A-R-E. Uh, you can check out our website, everything about the product is detailed there. You can also try the, the software very easily. Uh, just click on, I think it says try it for free at the top right. Yeah. And then you get um, anywhere between seven and 30 days to try it because we give you extra days in the trial as you, as you set it up further because we've seen that people who set it up well are actually more successful. And um, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, you can do that on LinkedIn. Um, just connect with me, but send me a personal message, uh, which says that you, you heard me on the Building the Future podcast, because otherwise uh, I will not be able to distinguish you with, from all the people that uh, send these uh, connection requests every day, yeah. like the spammers. So yeah. make sure to include a message. Very cool. And, and one thing that I, you touched on that I want to dive a little bit deeper on before I let you go is mm -hmm. you mentioned the trial thing. So how did you guys decide to go from seven days to 30 days as people progress through their trial period? Uh, it's just an experiment. So we used to have a 14 day trial. Okay. Uh, we did some analysis on that and we found that a lot of people's success is actually defined within that trial. Like we saw that uh, there are specific things that people do. And if they do them, then they actually uh, are much more successful at using the software and they stay with, much longer with us. And, and it's, it's not only the, the effect on the long run, but it's obviously also the effect on the short term, our conversion. And then we started thinking like, how can we stimulate that? And we started coming up with something that, um, yeah, it gives people more days on the trial as they go through the steps to set it up, um, which we see now is, is quite motivating to a lot of people. So you get on the software, you first get a walkthrough. At the end of that, it, it lands on this thing that says, okay, this is a setup guide. It's very easy. Here's some steps. Um, and then you can just click through these steps. It will always guide you to the right place. There's an explanation next to it. And when you complete it, automatically you get extra days on the trial immediately gets added. Um, you and your teammates, if you already have teammates, they all get a notification like, hey, uh, like this guy got you uh, an extra five days on the trial with a, a little party thing. Um, and that really motivates people. So we, we, we get much, much more successful customers right now, which is, which is what, it, what it's all about for us. Whether it, it needs to be, um, 30 days, that's the question. Um, right. But it's it's within the, the realm of the of the reasonable sort of trial length, I would say. And, and we actually see, it's a funny thing. Um, we used to have this 14 day trial, which you could extend for seven days. And I think the trials were about, uh, uh, I mean, like people would go from trial to paid in about 22 days or so. Uh, ah. It has now become 23, I think. Even though you can get 30 days of trial, uh, it didn't really affect um, the amount of time people spend on the trial. Interesting. And just for pe people out there, like you were, you basically were trial and erroring some of this stuff, right? Like, like you, mm -hmm. and, and then you kind of decide, figure out what works, keep what, keep what does and, and keep kind of iterating on that. That's interesting. That's actually really good advice. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, we uh, we look at stuff, we see things we want to improve, and then we start thinking about creative solutions. Uh, we try them, we make sure that we have a plan to measure, uh, and then we see whether it worked or not. Uh, 
luckily in most cases it has uh, some effect. The the effect effect of this uh, gamified setup guide uh, was quite 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 big. No, very cool. All right, well let's close again with mentioning where people can get more information about you guys and, and check you guys out online. Yeah, so uh, if you want to find out more about Salesflare, you can head to salesflare.com, uh, F-L-A-R-E. And if you want to get in touch with me, uh, just LinkedIn with a personal note uh, will do and, and we can, can have a chat. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day, man. Yeah, same. Thank you. And Thanks. Fun. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.